I'm John Bowden. Here's part two of our conversation with Rick Emmett, formerly of Triumph. Interesting thing when you leave a band, would you listen to the band's next album that wasn't featuring you? In this case, Phil X, Edge of Excess, we asked Rick Emmett. What was your opinion on Phil X and, and the, that next Triumph album? Did you, well, I mean, did you, did you listen to it right away? Were you just trying no. to get away from it? Yeah. Uh, well, it was, it was, I mean, I, I had I had a natural curiosity about it. First of all, I, I, I liked Phil X. He played, he played on frozen ghost albums and stuff. And, and, uh, and he, I knew of his skill and his, his talent, his ability as a player. Um, and then I think it was maybe, I don't know, a year or a year and a bit after I'd left, uh, Jim Norris of Canadian Musician Magazine, they were going to do some kind of a guitar workshop thing at, down at the Phoenix Theatre in Toronto. And they said, you know, Phil X is going to be there. You know, Do you have a problem with that? And I went, no, 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 that's that, that's fine. That's great. And so I, I saw him there and we met and he was a little like, oh, I, I, is this going to be weird? And I just went right up to him and shook his hand. I said, Phil, I said, there's nobody on the planet Earth that knows better what you've stepped into than me. And, you know, I wish you all of the luck in the world. I hope it goes great. I hope you really enjoy it. I hope... Because I said, I know more than anybody how hard, <laughs> I know how tough it can get. So, you know, good luck to you. And, and I meant it, you know, uh, there, I did not have a negative bone in my body about him being in that thing. But, you know, to be honest, when that record came out, Edge of Excess, I thought it was kind of a substandard thing. And, and, and a, it, I would never have wanted to be a guitar player in the band making an album like that one. I it just, I had lost my interest in that, you know, entirely by that point in time. So, you know, it didn't like, once I was out of it, I was out of it, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I would quote you a lot when, when, uh, since the first interview we did, I think in 2003, uh, I asked you about that, and uh, and we touched on it a few interviews after of, of like taking your wife on tour on a on a, a road trip with you. You know, I think you. I'm paraphrasing what you had said, but but I mentioned that to a lot of other artists, and and every time I'd say it, they go, "Oh my god!" They do that. Oh my god, that's so true. You know, like that. It's a, such a simplistic way of looking at it, but it's the right way of looking at it. Of uh, yeah. at, at that point, and you hadn't done, you know, I think you, you guys did the festival after that, and the, the European that, but that's all you did after that, right? Yeah, we did Sweden and we did Rock, Oklahoma. And but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not really letting anything out of the bag. We did a fan fest thing for the documentary where they flew fans in from all over the world, so a very small select group, and in one of Metalworks warehouses. We set up this stage. There was a screen in front of it that was showing them a kind of a thank you film from from the guys the banger had put together. But then they had the the screen on release hooks, and so it drops. The scrim drops, and there we were with our guitars on and, and kill at the drums, and we played three songs for them, and they went like just batshit crazy. It was incredible. It was an unbelievable feeling. It was like. You know, it, it was it's a double warehouse, so it's not it's not small by any means. But, um, you know, it would be like as if you were in a very small, narrow theater and you got a stage and you're playing to these people. And when when the scrim dropped and we started to play, they just surged out of their seats. And, and you know, everybody's up and everybody's just full of, oh, my God, this is the greatest moment of my life. And it's like you're in a wind tunnel or something. It's just this energy that's, you know flowing over you you're going like oh and you're just going okay keep your head down you kind of just keep your sea legs now just, just keep playing like just stay with the groove because there's this emotional thing that's like a cyclone it was it was an incredible feeling it was it was truly amazing and how many people get that in their life yeah. you know yeah. and it, granted this was fabricated for a documentary movie so that you know there's 20 cameras all around the room and they're capturing it from every single angle. And, you know, they've planned this out, but 
I don't care. It was planned so great. It was just storybook. It was an amazing thing. So, what three songs did you play? Uh, Lights Go Down, uh, Gil sang, and Lay It on the Line, and uh, Magic Power. Yeah. But what was it, I mean, that made you write this book? And where were you at in your life? Well, I mean, uh, all of those things that you said in your long preamble, uh, you know, that's where I'm at. I kind of retired from touring. And so I wasn't going out on uh, weekends anymore. And I had retired from teaching at the college. And um, I'm, you know, searching for what kind of creativity is going to make me feel fulfilled. And uh, I wrote a bunch of songs and guitar pieces and I had them up on my website so that fans could, you know, download them and stuff. And um, I'd gone through that cycle, but then this, the COVID thing was starting to kick in. And it was like, poetry offered me the opportunity to explore uh, on a creative level where there was a bigger license than exists when you're writing song lyrics, because song lyrics, uh, there's a discipline there where you're having to hit rhyme schemes and phrasing and you know, you come up with one structure, a verse, and then all the other verses have to sort of match that structure. With poetry, there's there's kind of different rules, less rules. In some respects, there's more, but um, those were those respects I was not respecting. <laughs> I kind of threw that out the window. Uh, you know, I mean, you can write haikus and you can write sonnets, and you know, th there's there's all kinds of structural forms. But there were a couple of books. There was a book by uh, a, a fellow named Adam Saul, How a Poem Moves. And I found that a very influential kind of um, book. To yeah. writing this, and this is, it's a brave thing you did. I'm, I don't know. I mean, were you a little nervous? I mean, you certainly pulled it off, but I don't know if I could have done this being in your shoes. I don't know if I could have done it. Well, you know, I appreciate that, but I, in the book, I also address the idea of courage. There's a, there's a poem called Courage of Convictions, where I talk about, you know, and, and, I, and I've had this conversation now. This has been a really interesting, fascinating chunk of my life now, doing interviews about the book, where people will read my own stuff back to me, and, and you know, you're, you're sort of being, you know, not crucified, but you're kind of getting hung on your own on words where you... You, you went through this creative process and decided this is how I want to say it. And then, you know, people are still asking you, yeah, so what do you mean by that? You go, well, it's to me, it's self-evident in the words, but, you know, obviously that's the thing about poetry is it has, it's like an onion, you know, it's got layers. And, and anyways, so courage to me, that's the process where you're going uphill against your fear. That's when you really kind of need the, that that you know in, in older days I called it the good fight you know the the idea of having to find something uh the, the you know you, what's the is there a Shakespearean phrase about you know screwing it to the sticking place or something you have to try and find this kind of inner strength to go uphill but then once you get there then the part of it where you say, you know, here you are, you're sitting with me and you're saying, oh, Rick, I think you're really brave. I think that's really courageous. To me, that's the downhill part. It's, that's easy. It's like the it, the toboggan is out of control and, and we're going downhill and it's happening so fast and so rapid now. And I'm old and I'm, in a way, I kind of don't give a shit about the fact that it's downhill because I've already done a lot of uphill things. And so I kind of go, well, you know, so... The writing of the poetry, yes, I understand what you mean about a, a courageous thing, and, and I get that. And and yes, there were moments of doubt, and there's moments of, and then there's things where you go, I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to reveal certain things about, you know, my marriage, you know, um, say things about my wife, or or, you know, go into details about my kids, other than, you know, uh, it's it's more just me. It's like how much of me am I am I willing to to reveal and talk about and 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 I go ah, you know my life's a kind of an open book I'm willing to make it even more of an open book at this point you know so because you're kind of wrestling with your own demons that's part of what's going on here so if you're not going to be sort of forthcoming about that and you're not going to open up and reveal 
then why are you doing it? Because in a way, and especially this book, the idea of reinvention is one where you're kind of going, going, all right, so here's some of my diary stuff. Here's some of my, you know, uh, therapy stuff, you know, psychotherapy things that I've been dealing with. Like, this is me. And and this is, uh, you know, uh, autobiographical. The fact that I was a rock star and the fact that, you know, I... Uh, that well, the one about matter. your brother, which, but the one about your brother, which is the I think it's the longest one, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. it's to me, it's the heart of the book, really. I mean, uh, that was a chunk where when he passed, I, it was something I could not cope with. It was just like I couldn't speak at his funeral, so I couldn't deliver a eulogy or something. Those kinds. Of, so in a way, those poems, the the two of them remembering Russell and the one about of his, his insatiable appetite for life, like. Those are the things where I'm paying tribute to him in the way that I think is the right way to do it. But it took me, you know, decades to get there, you know, uh, to the point where, and, and I felt like uh, those things matter. I want the world to be able to, I want to go on the record about that. And of course, poetry books don't sell much at all. You know, like, as I've joked in the bio for ECW Press, I said, you know, I've done jazz guitar records, so I kind of know what the bottom of the barrel is in terms of commercial stuff. Like, nobody's really interested in jazz records. So um, poetry's even worse. <laughs> so, you know, I get it. I understand that. Anyhow. We'll have more from Rick Emmett in three, four days. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. Buy a t-shirt. Help support the channel. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music.